Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's literary Zoom lecture brought to you by Wilton Library. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager here at the library, and I'm very pleased to be introducing this lecture today, which is made possible with the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Before we begin, first a few quick notes. Your microphones and cameras should be off, and it's important that you leave them off during the program. Also, because we have a large audience, we'll handle the Q&A at the end in the following, following way. You can send me your questions through the chat window, and I will ask them to Mark after his lecture. And Mark is also happy to answer questions that you can send him by email uh, later. Finally, we are very pleased to announce that we are bringing back today's speaker in two weeks to launch a four-week series on Homer's Odyssey. Our speaker, Mark Schenker, has been at Yale College since 1990 and is currently a Senior Associate Dean of the College and Dean of Academic Affairs. A former lecturer in the English Department at Yale, he received his PhD from Columbia University with a concentration in 19th century and early 20th century English literature. For over 30 years, Dean Schenker has lectured on literature and film and has led book discussions in more than 100 venues in Connecticut, including public libraries, retirement communities, museums, and cultural centers. And last October, Mark gave us a three-part series on reading James Joyce, and we're thrilled to have him back. So please join me in welcoming back Mark Schenker. Mark. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me say that the last time I gave this lecture was earlier this semester, I'll call it in March, on the morning of the day that the Connecticut libraries closed because of the pandemic. So there's something fitting of giving it again here in late May. So you know what you're getting yourselves in for. I'll talk for about 45 or 50 minutes about various approaches of how to think about literature if you're not a professional reader, someone who doesn't read for a living, but someone who wants to get out uh, more out of literature than just entertainment, although you should get entertainment as well. It's meant to be suggestive, not definitive, and it's meant to suggest def several different approaches in the view that you might find one more congenial than another. It's called literature and life, not to sound impressive like crime and punishment or war and peace, but to say that I believe that the best way to understand literature, and here I'm talking about largely realist, realistic literary fiction, that is fiction that presents characters and plots and places that seem real. Um, I want to talk about how on the one hand, uh, all literature is in the service of life, realistic literature, uh, competes with life, can even threaten to replace life. But all great literature reminds us that it itself is not life. And that's the challenge and glory of literature. How is this thing that is so realistic, so credible, these people who I grieve for and miss and feel that I know better than the people in my own neighborhood, how is it that those things are only things, not life, uh, but something unreal. So it's perhaps appropriate to note at the outset of a talk that every time we sit down to read a new story or novel, a new poem or play, and what I say is true of lots of kinds of art, but I'm talking today about literature. Every time we do that, we mark a new beginning in our lives. And one of the joys of literature is that these things have beginnings and endings in a way that episodes in our life doesn't. When does tomorrow begin for you? When you wake up, when you have your coffee, when you shower, when you do the first business of the day? It's hard to know even if you were paying attention. So what is it that's beginning when we live uh, a life that includes reading literature? So I'm gonna paraphrase a poem called Large Red Man Reading published in 1948 by Wallace Stevens. This poem is available online, Large Red Man Reading. It talks about a man who is large and red, that is alive. He has volume, he has color. Uh, and ghosts come back to listen to him reading 
on these great blue sheets of paper. They've come back from the wilderness of stars because in depth, they found there was nothing to keep them enthralled. Uh, Wallace Stevens believed that the greatest poverty was not to live in this physical world. So these dead, these ghosts, disappointed in the wilderness of the afterlife, come back to hear him read from the poem of life, of the pans above the table, the pots on the table, the tulips among them. That is, they come to hear him reading about just everyday stuff. These ghosts would, ghosts would have wept to step barefoot into reality. They would have wept and been happy to cry out, to run fingers over leaves and against the most coil horn. They would have laughed as he sat there reading from out of the purple sheets, um, uh, these Vatic lines, these prophetic lines, which in those ears and in those thin, those spended hearts took on color, took on shape and the size of things that they are and spoke the feeling for them, which was what they had lacked. I know it's hard to follow a poem as a first time listener, but the allegory here is that these dead would be happy to suffer pain to come back to life just to hear somebody read about stuff because of how satisfying stuff is. And they see and hear this man, this large red man, and red could just as easily be any other color. To be alive is to have color, maybe red, because it's the color of blood, of sanguinity. Uh, he's large because he has volume. He is what they are not. They are pale, they are thin. They would come back just to hear somebody reading. And the poem shifts from having him read blue sheets, blue tabulae, blue tablets, to purple tablets. And many people read the poem and don't notice that the blue sheets turn to purple. And the reason the blue sheets turn to purple is that they're being read by a red man. So that's the first lesson of the day. Every book you read is a collaboration between the book and you. There's no such thing as a blue book that's not inflected by a reader that also has color, perspectives, biases, knowledges, hopes, characteristics, and sensibilities. Every book you read is inflected by you as a reader. And if you want to read what the author originally intended, that's a kind of hopeless task. But you can read in the hopes to get out of it what most other people who are reading with a kind of attentiveness would get out of it. And that's the second piece of wisdom today. If you want to be a better reader, read books with other people. Talk with other people about the books you read. You can never see something that you'll never see. So when I ask the question about Gone with the Wind to a book group, what is this book is about? Many people would say the American Civil War, but only one person might raise her hand and say it's also about the Great Depression. Now it's not set in the Great Depression, but it was published in the Great Depression. And when Char uh, Scarlett O'Hara says, I'll never be hungry again, you can be assured that hundreds of thousands of people reading that book in the 1930s saw themselves in it and saw the devastation of a way of life in their own experience. And that's the point of literature. At the heart of all literature is what is at the heart of life, experience. Not a slogan, not a moral, not a principle, not even an idea. Experience, however modest or mundane, is what the thin, spended hearts of the dead long for in Wallace Stevens' poem. And the experience that a work of art, a work of literature conveys, is not held within the work as within the context of a container, context of a container. Uh, you don't throw the container away when you get the nugget that's inside. Rather, just as with lived experience, the experience of a literary work depends upon the circumstances, the sensibilities, the context, which includes the reader. This is why, again, the blue pages turn purple, read by a red man. He's alive, and one of the things you can do when you're alive is read. Our reading of a literary work is not a passive witnessing, but an interaction. We're not spectators, but participants. 
the experience that's conveyed or enacted, sometimes it can be uh, played out even if you're not reading a play, the experience conveyed or enacted by a work of literature can be emotional or intellectual or political or ethical or psychological or philosophical. Uh, that is, the experience can go through many different flavors of human enterprises. But to the, to the extent that the work is a literary work, it conveys an experience rather than mere, merely an idea, not a feeling that can be summarized in a word or a phrase. That's why I say all good literature competes with life. That's why people love characters and books, even though they know they're not real. That's why we can grieve for a character who dies or worse is killed in a book we're reading or a teleplay that we're watching. Literature can offer not just a version of life, but a respite of life. It can offer a kind of escape. Pablo Neruda wrote in his memoirs, intervals of dreaming help us stand up under days of work. And certainly one aspect of Freud's notion of dreams is that the creativity that we experience in our dreams that some part of our psyche is writing for us, gives us a rest as a spectator uh, from a world that seems to have so little meaning. T.S. Eliot wrote in the Four Quartets that humankind cannot bear very much reality. So that even the desire to educate ourselves with a great work of art or a great series of books like uh, next month's talk on uh, the 24 books of the Odyssey can also be an escape from everyday life. In its recreation of life, literature can serve as recreation, and I'm making the pun intentionally. By recreating something we recognize as life, it can also be a kind of play. We can see it there as something less than life, that is, it's trivial, it's cute, it's convenient or catchy, uh, or its form and artifice can serve as a kind of ritual and thus seem larger than life, the way that monumental Russian novels or epics by Homer or a book you read that might have a significance for you because it touches your own demographic or family history, or it may be rereading a book that was decisive in your own upbringing and the book can seem larger than life. But in either case, whether the book seems more like a game, an entertainment, a pastime, or more like a ceremony, a rite of passage, it's always bound by limits of one kind or another. Limits that can range from literary conventions, some things can't happen in certain kinds of books. It can range from conventions to the mere fact that the work has a beginning and an end. The covers of a novel, like the rising and falling curtains of a play, give the experience of art a shape that sets it off from the relative formlessness of everyday life. Not underestimate how comforting the idea that books have beginnings and endings matter because so much of life has the chaos of uh, lack of discipline or order. Uh, those of you who are fans of any kind of uh, sport to watch or game to play, Scrabble or Bridge or Mahjong or cards, know that there's something exciting about having rules of play and having there be a beginning and an end. This talk today, uh, I won't pretend that it's a work of art, but it has a beginning and an end. And uh, if you're not here, uh, at the beginning, you've missed something. If you have to leave before the end, you miss something. And however much or little you think about what I have to say, certainly more can go on in this hour than might have gone on in what you might have done instead with this hour. Depending on your life, you might have done something better. But we shouldn't underestimate how much beginning and ends of works matter when so much of life is not marked by a clear beginning and end. But what may have an element of play for us, and think about that one kind of literature or plays, uh, it's always a work of creation. Uh, in the Stevens poem, he used the, uses the Greek word poesis 
P-O-E-S-I-S, which in the Greek's time meant only making. The poet was a maker, uh, like a carpenter. All art involves work, and a work of literature has four elements, as the critic M.H. Abrams noted more than a half century ago. So what I'm about to say for the next few minutes comes from a very wise and influential literary critic named Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, Abrams. He said that every work of art, again, I'm focusing on literature, needs a maker. Someone has to create it. Something has to be made for our purposes, a literary object. Something has to be the subject of this thing taken from the universe of things or ideas or people or experiences, whether real or remembered or projected or imagined. It has to be about something. Even if you said, this book is about nothing a la Seinfeld, that's a something in the context of the work of art being about something. And somebody has to consume it. Somebody has to read it or see it or hear it. There has to be a reader audience. So someone to make it, something to be made, it's made about something or conveys something uh, to someone. All critical approaches, whether it's by a professional reader, a teacher, a critic, an editor, a book reviewer, or a common reader, all of us who read because we like reading. That's a phrase from Virginia Woolf. It's not meant to be insulting. It's meant to mean common in the sense of common humanity, people who read as human beings. All schools of interpretation of literature, no matter how sophisticated, can concern themselves only with one or more of those four elements. There are no other elements in a work of art. And uh, Abram says we can focus on those four things in different ways. And for the purposes of this illustration, let's imagine that we have a bias towards one of those four. If we're only interested in who the maker is and what's being communicated. If we want to learn a lot more uh, about uh, Charles Dickens and we're fascinated by him and we read his novels for suggestions about his own autobiography and his novels can reveal that, he calls that the expressive view, that is what the writer is expressing about himself. If we're interested in the literary work as a work of art, not who made it or why, not what I can do with it, not what it's about, but how does it work? If you want to learn something about the conventions of Shakespearean drama, if you want to learn something about postmodernist fiction, uh, that's called the objective view. You're interested in the work of art as an object. A lot of the teaching I do in uh, academic environments and with my book groups focuses on why does this book have 19 chapters? Why does this scene end here and that scene begin there? Why does the novel shift from past tense to present tense and so on? That's the objective perspective. If you wanna know how well the work conveys the world it represents, and here again, the world can be real or imagined. It can be quite specific, 19th century St. Petersburg and Nana Karenina, or it can be generalized, adolescence, in uh, The Catcher in the Rye. That's called the mimetic view. Uh, mime here in the sense of imitation. Uh, it's a Greek word, mimesis, for copying. That one of the things we like about literature is it copies life. We feel we can learn about other people and places credibly because these books we read seem real, whether it's a travelogue or a journey into someone else's experience. That's called the mimetic view. And last, What's in it for the reader? The effect that the work has on him or her. Uh, what am I getting out of it? Um, uh, and that's called, um, uh, the uh, pragmatic view, sorry. Pragmatic doesn't mean in the sense of practical uh, that you're gonna use the book to put under uh, the shaky leg of a table. It means practical in the sense of you're getting some use out of it. So if you're reading it to know more about literature, that's pragmatic. If you're reading it because you think that reading it will make you a better writer, that's pragmatic. If reading it to improve your vocabulary or you're an ESL person and you want to improve your English, 
If you think that great literature makes you a better person, that's pragmatic. And I'm quite serious. If you choose a painting to hang in your living room because it looks good with the sofa, and I don't say this as a joke, that's a perfectly good reason to like a work of art where it is, that interior decor, what that picture lends to your home matters to you. That's also pragmatic. So focusing on the reader, the consumer of the art is pragmatic. So if you're drawn to the adventures of Augie March by Saul Bellow, because you're fascinated with its realistic descriptions of the immigrant Chicago neighborhood in which he was born and comes of age, you're gravitating to the mimetic dimension of the novel, its ability to recreate a concrete world. If you're pulled to the novel to connect to Saul Bellow's own life and art, the process of creation or his personal development, then you're involved in the expressive dimension of the book. If you look to learn something about life or connect empathetically to Augie himself or through Augie to Bellow, you're moving to the pragmatic dimension of the novel, what use you can make of it. Lastly, if you're interested in what the first person narration adds to your experience of the book or how it functions as a coming of age novel, then you're connecting to its objective dimension. Of course, most people's responses to literature embrace more than one of these or all of them at once. And as Abram points out, the four initials of those approaches, P for pragmatic, O for objective, E for expressive, and M for mimetic, give a convenient mnemonic of poem. I say this because you may find that by thinking of the schema, you actually have favored one kind of dimension over another over the years, and you may be very happy uh, with your unconscious uh, uh, disposition, uh, or you may want to expand it and try the next time you read something to pay more attention to another dimension. Uh, I am not urging you to do that. There's nothing prescriptive or proscriptive about this lecture. I'm just pointing out that that's all there is. There's no fifth way. In each and all of these dimensions, you're being drawn outside yourself to experience something, an artist, a world, an experience, the object itself, something, uh, the form, symbols, metaphors, narration, other than your own self. One of the things literature makes possible is a chance for a time to stop being you. Uh, many of us have been isolated in circumscribed circumstances for months. It's wearying uh, not to spend time with other people. We tire of ourselves. In one of his novels, The Secret Agent, Joseph Conrad has a character say, we never cease to be ourselves. Uh, that tyranny of identity that everywhere I go, there I am, is one of the things that literature can help cure for a while. Literature provides a break in our necessary self-absorption in our own lives. And I don't mean self-absorption in the merely trivial sense of worrying how the traffic will be on the way to work or how you're gonna pay the bills or the mere sense of worrying uh, about whether that twinge in your tooth will require a visit to the dentist, but really also in the more existential way that in every moment of our lives, every experience we have is filtered through our own senses and consciousness. In one way, of course, even literature does not overthrow this tyranny of the self. Every book, every love letter, every newspaper column, every recipe you've ever read, if you've actually read it and not heard it, for example, you've heard in the same voice in your head. In more important ways, literature does invite us to step out of the cycle of wherever you go, there you are. Even if a novel, for example, does not provoke a permanent change in our thinking, and of course it can, it always requires a temporary change in our consciousness, if only in giving ourselves over to another voice, another rhythm, another reality. Otherness is central to the aesthetic experience. Um, even if you think that the reason you like to read um, 
um, Virginia Woolf or Ian McEwen is you think they write beautifully, you may also mean that the rhythm, the music of their prose fits your sensibility. You're comfortable there. It may even fit the brain patterns of how you think or speak or sing. So this idea that otherness is central to the aesthetic experience, I wanna consider Anna Karenina to offer you another piece of what I think is wisdom. Let's say you have very strong personal feelings as to what should happen to adulteresses, whether it's at a religious or ethical or uh, something that comes from your background. You have a very strong feeling of what should happen to a woman who commits adultery. And when you read Tolstoy's masterpiece, you take some satisfaction in Anna's suicide as a fate she deserves. And if that's a spoiler for any of you in 2020 to tell you how Anna Karenina ends, don't blame me. If you read the book in this way, that is in your way only, and you take satisfaction in the fact that this sinful woman has decided to throw herself under a train, you're not reading Anna Karenina, you're reading you. And you spent 900 pages and many hours of your life to do that. You could have saved yourself a lot of time and not read the book at all. But if you read it as something that is truly outside yourself, something other than you, that is if you read it right, which doesn't mean in one way only, I don't mean if you read it my way. If you read it as something other than you, you will come to see, of course, that Anna is much more than just an adulteress because the novel refuses to let you, if you read it correctly, that is openly, it refuses to let you see her as only one thing because the novel gives her an interior life. The novel works against stereotype by giving you a range of experience about Anna. You don't have to like her. You certainly don't have to love her. You can still judge her if you're in the habit of judging. But if you're willing to allow the literary experience to be fully experienced, you will see that she's not just an adulteress. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to meet the novel more than halfway, if you're willing to let the literary experience of the novel cross over into your own lived experience, you will come to see that no woman, real or imagined, is only an adulteress. There's no categorical thinking. And that's the transformation that literature makes possible. How often do we hear from people who we know have very rigid expectations of certain demographics, whether it's racism or a bias or a true hatred, and only when that stereotype gets shattered because that kind of person comes into their life, their aging mother has a woman from West India, a West Indian woman who is a saint Maria is wonderful in taking care of my mother. And for the first time, the daughter has to experience someone who's West Indian as someone actually in her life and the stereotype is shattered. That can happen in literature too. It can happen with Anna Karenina. We cannot know most people we meet beyond their exterior selves, but literature allows us an interior view of imaginary people with whom we engage as if they were real. And this invitation to empathetic imagination, what is it like to be somebody else? Um, that's one of the gifts that literature offers us. James Joyce has Leopold Bloom say in the great novel Ulysses, the longest way round is the shortest way home. Uh, the way we live our lives to have the most experiences, uh, the most um, uh, touches with other people, other things, the more that reality can ping on us, the richer our lives are. And we're feeling some of that depri deprivation in the opposite way in these past few months. John Foster Hall, who is an English music hall and radio com uh, comedian who died in 1945, said we are all on earth to help others, but what on earth the others are here for, I don't know. That idea that we depend upon other people because we care about them for our own purposes. We want to spectate or consume them, but what about them as people we could actually get to know? 
literature offers us an opportunity to suspend not just disbelief, that is, we, we actually believe that these uh, fonts on the page tell a story about an actual person named Anna Karenina, excuse me, even though she never exists. It can ask us to suspend not just our disbelief, but our belief, our judgment for a time. It invites us to suspend ourselves for a time. It allows us to participate in what the poet John Keith called negative capability, the inability, I'm sorry, the ability to experience at one time two or more different even opposing ideas or feelings. That is, I think adulteresses are bad people, and yet I feel very sympathetic to Anna Karenina. More recently than John Keats, the novelist Ian McEwen underscored what a, liter a literature makes possible uh, that the real world does not in his novel Atonement, which was published in 2001. In the early pages of the book, the precocious Bryony considers the question, was everyone really alive as she? Some four chapters later, the narrator says of her, she was weary of being outdoors, but she was not ready to go in. Was that really all there was in life, indoors or out? Wasn't there somewhere else for people to go? I was raised by a woman who would tell me constantly to close the door, in or out, make up your mind, I'm not heeding the entire neighborhood. Maybe you knew such a woman in your past. Well, in life, there is typically only the choice of outdoors or indoors. But in literature, in art, in our imagination, there can be indoors and outdoors at the same time, or a world with no doors or endless other options. As readers of the novel, Atonement know, Bryony pays a price for doubting the reality of other people. And in atoning for her solipsism, her solipsism, her self-centeredness, she goes to a somewhere in the novel that is neither indoors or outdoors, the world of fiction. Her world becomes a world of fiction and crosses over into ours. In the world of art, we're not limited to the alternatives of this or that. You can read or view Othello, for example, and admire Iago for his cleverness, even as you loathe his villainy. There's that negative capability of John Keats. You can feel two ways about him. You can accept the attraction he holds for you, uh, and most people, I'm one of them, feel that the play always becomes most interesting when he's on the stage. You can feel that attraction without having to trouble about mundane questions, such as what you would do if he existed and moved into your neighborhood or started dating your sister. You don't have to worry about the real consequences, even though if you thought of him realistically, he might be threatening. Uh, while you enjoy his evil as a kind of um, spectacular performance. Literature can permit us to spend time, real time, intimate time with flawed, or sinful or villainous characters without having to explain or excuse ourselves. We can rub uh, elbows in the pages of a novel or in the scenes of a play with a naughty or wicked character and not have to apologize to anyone for the company we're keeping. It was Mark Twain who famously said, we go to heaven for the climate, but to hell for the company, because that's where the really interesting people are in hell. And of course, the reverse is also true. Literature allows us to commune with the great and the good, the noble and the remarkable, the heroic, the inspiring. It's not an accident that we use the word character, uh, comes from the Greek, to refer both to a person in a story or play and to the moral substance of actual men and women. women. The Greek word character, or the origin of it, meant to inscribe, and that word in turn came from a word meaning a pointed stick, the way you can write something on the sand or you can inscribe something on the inside of a ring. Uh, as if, and it's used about people, as if natures or natures were written upon us with some kind of stylus. You see how writing uh, slops over into character formation. 
We, ex we assess people, we experience people, not just by what they say and do, but if we're intimate with them, if we know how they think and they feel by their entire sensibility. Now in real life, there's a limited number of people we know that way. I know that there are some people in the audience today who are actually friends of mine. I hope you feel the same way. Um, and I know you better than I know most of the people in the room. But I know hundreds of people in art, in literature, better than I know most of the people in the room today. And you're all real, I'm assuming. And none of them are. None of the people in literature are real. But I get to see them in a different dimension, in a fuller dimension, a fuller perspective, than I can know you, unless there's a surprise in our future. Literature invites us to experience remarkable fictional characters from the inside out. But between the wicked and the wonderful, between the hateful and the heroic, there remains the broad band of everyday human life in all its great mundane variety. Family life, sexual love, friendship, the experience of childhood, the journey into adulthood, the challenges of work and vocation, the comforts of the mere physical world, like those pots and pans and tulips in the poem by Wallace Stevens. Literature pulls us away from life for a time, from the routine of living, to offer us life in another guise, to give us experience, but in italics or brackets or in a shout or in a whisper or in a spectacle or in a sudden quiet sensation. And in recreating life, in inviting us to look away from the living and at an artistic object that is not real in the sense of living, literature also reminds us that the object is only an object. It's not life. It's not factual. Think of Magritte's famous painting, and you can put it up again if you want, uh, Michael, that is on the title card of this series, Magritte's famous painting, Ceci n'a pas un pipe. This pipe that is not a pipe. The painting actually includes uh, the script underneath it that says in French, he was Belgian, this is not a pipe. So we have a realistic painting of a pipe, a better pipe than I could ever hope to make, that even as it conveys what Stevens, Wallace Stevens might call the very pipiness of pipes, a three-year-old would know that's a pipe. Uh, it reminds us even as it does it that it's not a pipe. Uh, it's art. Uh, the tyranny of objects is uh, also what that painting is called. That is that Marit is saying, remember that thinking that something that absolutely looks like a pipe is itself not a pipe. And that's part of the paradox of literature. These people that you love in novels, in teleplays, in uh, the Netflix movies you maybe binge watch, um, they're not real. But of course they have all the power and attraction of life, that's the point, but they're not real. And if you want to experience the art uh, more broadly, think about both how they're not real and what that means, why they maybe are stereotypical or certain motifs or images, or why an installment may end when it does, even as you think about them the way you might think about people in your family or someone in your neighborhood. So you have this pipe that's not a pipe. In contrast, I'll remind you of a scene from the movie, The Deer Hunter. In it, Michael Bronsky, the character who's played by Robert De Niro, becomes frustrated with the flakiness of his friend Stanley, the character played by John Cazale. The men are out on a hunting expedition and Stanley's unpreparedness exasperates Michael, who holds up a rifle bullet and says, Stanley, See this? This is this. This ain't something else. This is this. And he's angry. On the one side, the side of the deer hunter, the side of Michael Bronsky, De Niro's character, the reality principle as clear as a bullet, as clear as a shot. This is this. We're hunting and you can't screw up. It's no time for metaphor, for symbols, Sometimes this is just this. But on the other side, 
the Magritte side, the unreality principle, as rich as the paradox of Magritte's famous caption, this is not a pipe. Literature, like all art, invites us to visit it for a time, even as it reminds us that the time has to be up, that we must return. It invites us to look away from life so that we can look back on life with expanded eyes, eyes that have been given a greater range of vision, a greater ability to see detail and nuance because we looked away. It refreshes us the way a vacation does. I have sometimes the unhappy obligation to talk to students at Yale who are being withdrawn for one of a variety of reasons. But to be withdrawn from Yale is not to be expelled. And so they can come back, and most of them do, and in short order. And I tell them, and not to be cute, that we want to have them back. But the only way we can have them back is they have to go away. That is, they have to address the issue that's stopping them from continuing. Literature pulls us away because it knows we have to go back. And it's what we do with our time away that is going to determine how successful we are when we get back. The longest way round, again, Joyce, is the shortest way home, says Joyce's peripatetic Dubliner, Leopold Bloom. Literature is a detour on the road of life, not an escape, and certainly not just standing still or idle. And like all good detours, it takes us away to deliver us back safely to where we were going in the first place, but at a different place. And so I will end as I began. All literature is in the service of life, even as it competes or even threatens to replace life, and even as it recognizes that it is not itself life. Thank you. Well, Mark, uh, that, was, that was great. Um, I hadn't heard this one from you before and I really had uh, only a general idea of where you were going with this. It was very, very thought provoking. I just want to mention to people, you can send me, if you have a question or a comment, you can put it in the chat and I'll, and I'll relay that to Mark. I just want to mention one thing that, that struck me in the course of your talk, Mark. I really like the phrase, the tyranny of identity and how reading literature um, helps you to escape from that tyranny. And the phrase where we tire of ourselves, which I think people can relate to a lot, especially in the last couple of months, but, but one thing that it also reminded me of was the uh, Harold Bloom uh, once said in an interview uh, when he was uh, talking about his book, uh, How to Read and Why. And he said, we read literature because we don't have time to meet enough people. And that fits in with what you were saying about knowing these characters in literature in many ways even better than people that you actually are acquainted with in real life. And he went on to say that as you get older, it gets even harder to meet more people. And he kind of cracked a joke that, you know, the people that you do know have sort of, they've said to you what they're going to say, and you've said to them what you're going to say. And that reading allows you to meet other individuals. Yeah. And let me say again to everyone who's attending, I'm really sincere when I say, when we set up this talk that I'd speak for 45 or 50 minutes, knowing that it would only leave uh, 10 minutes or so for questions, and knowing that we'd have scores of people, some of whom might want to ask questions. I'm quite sincere, and I've done this in other Zoom meetings in the last few months. Uh, Michael can give you, if he hasn't already, my email address. And I will assure you that if you have a question that I can answer, and you want to send it to me by email. I have answered every question that I've received by email in Zoom talks I've given in the last couple of months, even if the answer is, I don't know. And so if you have a question uh, that you're burning to ask and Michael doesn't pass it on to me, uh, don't get frustrated. Send me an email. Uh, and again, Michael can give you that. Or if you're in a position to write it down, it's my first name, Mark, with a K. Um, dot Schenker, S-C-H-E-N-K-E-R, at Yale.edu. 
uh, and I will get back to you promptly, which means within a day or two of getting the question. So Michael, do you want to pass on from the chat any question, especially if it concerns anything that I said this evening? Sure. Well, one question that we've got here is that what about the phenomenon of identifying with the characters as a person? Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure what what is meant by what about. That's a kind of broad question. Yeah. But I will say that one of the magical things about literature is writers' ability to, in a few hundred pages, uh, most novels a few hundred pages, uh, to invest a character. Not every sentence in the book is about that character with a roundedness so that we not only believe that that character is real, uh, competes with uh, people we know, I don't mean competes in the sense of a, a, a game or competition, uh, is up there in the same level of experience uh, and that we actually care about the choices that they make. Um, that's a natural thing. Many people like to read novels best when they find people in the novel they can identify with. They don't like novels where there aren't people they don't like. I try to tell my students and my book group readers that if you want to be a better reader, uh, be open to reading books where what you like is the book style, uh, the book structure, the book's climate, the weather of the book, the feel of the book, even though it might be loaded with uh, not nice people. Uh, in the same way that in your life, you may gravitate in your friendships, in your families, to people who are like you. But everybody in the Zoom room knows that some of our best connections are with friends and family who are decidedly not like us. And that we, we love about the relationship is what they do to challenge us or oppose us or compliment us with an E um, and, and fit what we don't have. There's a theory of literature about that too. Um, Tolstoy said famously, uh, and probably partly in humor, that he looked around the world and didn't see anyone quite like Anna Karenina, so he made her. That is, he created his art to fill a gap, to fill a gap in the world, not to copy something that was already there, but to add something that wasn't. So I wanna say, if your tendency when you read is to find people like you, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but you may become a better reader if you think about what your relationship can be with people who aren't like you at all. Somebody once asked a writer at a conference that I was at uh, when he said that every character he ever wrote had a little bit of him in them in the same way he said that Freud says when you have a dream that somebody's chasing you, the person who's chasing you is you chasing you. And the person you run to for help is another version of you. They said to him, what if you consciously sat down to create a character who is nothing like you? And he answered, it would probably be so much like me, I'd be terrified. Um, I think we all read on a continuum of what we're drawn to uh, and what we try to avoid. Literature gives us that choice. We can be drawn to something without having to pay a price for it. Great. So someone has just asked, uh, it's, it's not exactly in reaction to something you said, but I think it's related. Is there a particular piece of classic literature that you have been especially drawn to revisit during this period of the epidemic? Well, I, I, uh, I appreciate the spirit of that question. I really do. I'm not kidding. Uh, I have not had time to read literature beyond the things I'm committed to read uh, because my life at Yale has become supernaturally busy. I'm not the only person that's true of. Um, dean of Academic Affairs in a college that is changing the nature of how people teach and learn and get graded uh, has been a task. But I will say, and it allows me, Michael, to do a public service announcement and a plug, I never tire of reading The Odyssey and The Iliad. And when Michael suggested to me back after I finished the Joyce, How to Read Joyce series last year, that I could do a series uh, of four lectures on the Odyssey sometime in the early summer. And thanks to Michael, that's still going to be true in a Zoom environment. And then follow it up possibly, or maybe definitely, Michael can tell us, with a four-part series on Ulysses, 
with the Odyssey in mind, uh, it made me uh, very happy. My son, who is a 30-something uh, lawyer, I'm not being coy when I say 30-something, I'd have to do the math, uh, who lives in Brooklyn and works in Manhattan when he's working in real life, um, asked me some months ago, what would I recommend that he read uh, in the pandemic? And I recommended that he read the Odyssey and then the Iliad in the Robert Fagel translation. Uh, he decided to start with the Iliad, even though it comes second, because that's what he's like, my son. Uh, and so he's reading that. Uh, I would say that I never tire of reading those two great poems, because even though the one of them uh, is about a war that was won by the Greeks, that is by the people of the poet who wrote the poem, it is absolutely an anti-war poem. And it is fully committed to looking at what is lost by war. The savagery of war is thrown up in opposition to the importance of civilization. And uh, um, if you seen the blurb for my talks on uh, the Odyssey that are coming up, of course, that's the second great uh, epic, The Return. Uh, part of what that epic is about is that for all the adventuring and supernaturalism, for all the visit to savage places of gods and monsters that want to destroy uh, Odysseus and his men, and largely do, the poem is a celebration of civilization. And it ends with a celebration of various artifacts of wood, one of the simplest things in the world, the wood of a bed, of a tree, of a, an oar. And uh, I would say that one of the things we are reminded of in this terrible time of biology trumping, uh, sorry, biology overriding technology, uh, that what a microbe can do to a civilization is how much we value civilization in its civilized form, this notion of codes and behavior. And I'm not being polemical when I say the issue of masks and distancing and how we treat other people and the aberration of people intentionally coughing on other people is on a continuum with the necessity to be disciplined and courteous in the strongest sense of being civilized. And it brings us back to literature. One of the things that readers have, people who read literature often, is a discipline to give themselves over to chapters uh, to counteract their restlessness. And we're all restless in different ways by actually sitting down and paying attention to a book who determ which determines the rhythm that we read. We can't read it our way if it's written that way. Uh, and so I do think the example of courtesy, of civilization, of community in the old Greek classics uh, is always, um, is never out of date. And I think that's a fantastic way to conclude this. Um, as Mark said, if you've got additional questions or after you think about this a bit, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll give you Mark's uh, email address if you didn't have a chance to jot it down. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks where we start the Odyssey program. Um, hey, and the um, Ulysses program is on the calendar for the fall. Keep our fingers crossed. Maybe we'll even do it live together. Um, once again, I want to thank Mark for a great program. Always love his programs. Looking forward to the next one in two weeks. And thanks you all for uh, taking, taking time out of your uh, day to, uh, to participate with us. Yes, and I, I want to thank all of you who came, even though I can't see you. I believe you're there. I want to thank Michael, who puts more work into this than might be obvious, including a little rehearsal with me yesterday. And of course, my thanks to the Wilton Public Library. I sincerely hope you all stay safe and healthy and as sane as you're able. I will uh, see you, quotation marks, next time. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. See you soon.